Hello, my name is Eduardo Aramataris and I'm from the Joanna Briggs Institute, an organisation that promotes and supports the synthesis, translation and utilisation of, re of research evidence into healthcare practice worldwide. And today I'm going to take you beyond the search and how librarians can help maximise the quality of systematic reviews. So for this presentation, over the next hour, I'm going to tell you a bit about the part systematic reviews play in the evidence-based healthcare process. Um, I'm going to introduce you to systematic reviews, some of their characteristics and their defining features, and some of the terminology that, you're that you will encounter around systematic reviews. I'll briefly take you through the systematic steps in the systematic review process. But for the most part, I'll be focusing in on this journey where you as a librarian may be involved. And in particular, the librarian's uh, role focusing around these steps in the systematic review process. That is the all important development of the question and the, the PICO, you will have heard of this PICO mnemonic that is derived directly from the review question and, and the formulation of the eligibility criteria for the review. I'll also be talking about the librarian's role in developing the search strategy and undertaking the all-important search itself. You may have heard systematic reviews referred to as pillars of evidence-based healthcare. Now, just to briefly um, explain to you how they fit this role as pillars of evidence-based healthcare, I'd like to first introduce you to the uh, our model of evidence-based healthcare and the Joanna Briggs Institute model of evidence-based healthcare. So if I can just draw your attention here to the right of the slide, you can see it's a circular model and at the middle is evidence-based practice. So these are the decisions that a practitioner might be making in healthcare practice where they're using their judgment uh, and expertise, their past experience to inform their, those decisions, they're using client preference and the premise of evidence-based healthcare is that in that process, in that decision-making process, they should also be using research evidence. So where does that come from? Well, here in this model, this purple slice of the pie really represents that field of research evidence that's out there. The, the millions of academic articles, the research studies such as the randomised control trials, um, the cohort studies, the case control studies. Um, there are all different sorts of evidence here. Evidence isn't just conducted scientifically to derive numbers. In this, there are diverse forms of evidence available in the scientific literature. Um, there's research that addresses the meaningfulness of interventions and treatments, not just their effectiveness, and that would look like qualitative research. An opinion piece, for example, can also be considered as evidence, and they are often put in writing. Um, a practitioner might refer to their colleague across the patient bed um, to, to draw upon their expertise, but there's no reason why that same practitioner can't draw on a published piece from another doctor, for example, on the other side of the world to also inform their decision making. Now, how do practitioners do this? And this is really where systematic reviews are so important in the evidence-based healthcare process and underpin so much of what is going on. The time poor clinician who's looking after patients day in, day out, is expected to be able to access this evidence, find appropriate evidence in relation to any particular type of clinical question they may have, um, assess it to make sure it's good, and then use that to inform their decision making. And that's a really big ask of any clinician. And that's a lot of what stimulated this um, need for evidence synthesis. And specifically this, this um, research project or process that's called the systematic review. So the systematic reviewer will ask a clinical question and basically essentially is doing secondary research on this existing body of research. And I'll take you through those systematic steps that really define a systematic review in a moment. But it doesn't just end there. These are pillars of evidence-based healthcare because in this evidence-based healthcare cycle, in this model here, they really underpin so much of what comes next. And another important part of that is not just enough to create this wonderful research document that may be 60 or 100 or 200 pages worth, because not even that is terribly useful to the busy clinician at the point of care. What we need are means of being able to get it to the clinicians. And for that, these systematic reviews might inform education, programs about the use of guidelines, 
and they might uh, form other, there might be other means of information, um, uh, evidence summaries or the like that may be embedded in systems such as the JBI Connect Plus database, which is a point of care system where a lot of the, the, the evidence that's embedded in there is derived from these projects here, these systematic review evidence syntheses. And beyond the knowledge transfer or the evidence transfer, there's the all important and probably the hardest part in the evidence-based healthcare cycle, that is the evidence utilisation. To know that using the evidence actually has some sort of impact in practice. And to do this, where we embed evidence in practice, we then look to see that it has some change in the system or the process or even patient outcomes. So, moving on to systematic reviews and a bit of an introduction to systematic reviews. I'd just like to start where they all came from. Um, this gentleman here, the namesake for the, the Cochrane collaboration, uh, quite a while back, complained really, saying that it's surely a great criticism of our profession, and he was referring specifically to medical doctors in this case, and um, that we have not organised a critical summary by specialty or subspecialty updated periodically of all relevant randomised controlled trials. Essentially, he was saying, what we do in practice, we should be looking to the experimental evidence that will give us allow us to make a causal association to say, if we do this, we'll see this result in practice. Because the evidence was out there, but it just hadn't been organised so they could use it. Um, at this, and that's really what spawned this whole process of systematic reviews and this research undertaking that are systematic reviews. And since that time when they appeared in the literature, it's about 1990, um, they really have, those of you who are familiar with the content of, of uh, data by bibli the bibliographic uh, citation database, such as Medline and the like, there's really been an exponential rise in the number of systematic reviews since about 1990 onwards. It is really important, I'm not going to go into too much detail today, but to appreciate that many of us are very familiar with the traditional literature reviews. A systematic review is a class or a brand of literature review, but it is quite different from a traditional literature review. I'm not going to go into any great detail, but I'm sure you'll come to realise that as I move through exactly what a systematic review is. So, here are two statements. What is a systematic review? an attempt to identify, appraise and synthesise all the empirical evidence that meets pre-specified eligibility criteria to answer a given research question. An attempt to sum up the best available research on a specific question. This is done by synthesising the results of several studies. There are some key points in both of these statements. An attempt to identify this is why the searching process is so important. An attempt to identify all the empirical evidence in relation to a particular question. Once it's identified, this other key feature of the systematic review, the appraise. We don't just take everything we find at face value. There needs to be a critical eye cast over the quality of that research and should it actually be used to inform practice or not. And then synthesise. Notice neither of these statements stop at a simple summary. There's a synthesis of the results of these individual studies, so that practice is based on more than one. And when we talk about synthesise, if we're talking about quantitative evidence, you will have heard of the term meta-analysis, the statistical combination of evidence. Similarly, when we talk about qualitative data that might be uh, derived from uh, a phenomenological study, where a researcher might interview or speak to a patient or a participant directly in the study, we can also synthesise that sort of evidence. And that's what we call a metasynthesis, where textual data is combined. But with this synthesis, what's coming out the end, and why this is such an important research process, certainly has the potential to be more than simply the sum of its parts. You've all clearly heard of the term systematic reviews. But it is really important to appreciate that everything that carries this title does not hold up to what a systematic review should be. Just as in the world of primary literature, we cast our eye to give a critical eye over the literature that exists. Similarly, this word is quite frankly bandied around quite loosely, even through the medical literature. You will see 
um, throughout what are called systematic reviews, quite stark variations in the conduct of this type of research. Um, some of that is driven by the different questions that are asked and the appropriate methodologies dependent on the different questions that are asked. We might have the Cochrane or the JBI type review of effectiveness, which is very clear internationally accepted methods and methodologies that are followed. Um, the questions we talk about, e uh, questions of etiology of disease or harmful outcomes of interventions that are used, well here we need different types of evidence. But then there are different methodologies for qualitative um, um, type reviews, or even there are new methodologies of systematic reviews that are appearing as well. For example, realist syntheses, some of which, not all of these different ways of doing reviews have been validated or in fact internationally accepted. So what I'll be taking you down the line about what the international consensus is, what organisations such as the Joanna Briggs Institute and the Cochrane Collaboration essentially dictate of what a systematic review should be. So these are some of the defining features of what a Joanna Briggs Institute systematic review would look like. First of all, it should be protocol driven with an a priori protocol, which is used a to guide the reviewers themselves and, um, and also to, to allow anyone to, to minimise bias and to allow anyone to see exactly how this research question is going to be addressed. But these are the important steps, the systematic steps in this systematic process. First of all, to formulate the review question. Secondly, to define these eligibility criteria that are derived directly from that question. The all-important search to locate the international uh, evidence about that question. From these inclusion and exclusion criteria, we then move into study selection from the results of that search. Um, we go through this process often referred to as critical appraisal or if we're talking about a quantitative review, assessment of risk of bias. We assess study quality using standardised instruments. Similarly, we abstract or, uh, the, the important data relevant to our question using um, tools, similar standardised instruments also. And once we've extracted the relevant data, we can move into our analysis or synthesis um, and summary of those relevant studies. We present those results and then interpretation of those results and how applicable they are. So, now, in that process, I'd just like to now, for the rest of this presentation, really follow in focus in specifically on what the, where the librarian's role normally sits and how the librarian can really add value in maximising the quality of systematic reviews. Now, an important thing to realise is that nobody works in isolation on a systematic review process. Normally it's that researcher who's driving the process from the beginning through to the end, through all of those steps. But at different points through all of those steps, they do rely on different people. Initially, right at the beginning, and if it's funded research, the funder clearly, in, some, in these cases, often has a big say in what sort of question may be addressed by any particular systematic review. Um, a systematic reviewer might fit in this point here, the methodologist with experience in conducting reviews, and that could be a little or a lot of experience, um, but there'll be other people involved, dependent on the question asked, there might be some content or topic experts. And um, certainly when we get down to that synthesis stage, the meta-analysis for example, there will often be statisticians involved who may not be involved quite heavily right at those beginning phases of the systematic review. And that's really where the librarian's role sits in. At these first three steps in the systematic review process, which is where I'm going to focus in now. Now, whilst it's not the focus of this presentation, I think it is worthwhile Certainly, because if you're going to be involved in this sort of research undertaking, that you as librarians are aware of what does come next. And there's a lot of information out there available. Or well, there are also uh, courses available about the conduct of, comprehensive, of systematic reviews, which we do also conduct in the Joanna Briggs Institute. So I'm going to focus in now on these three steps, which is really where we interact quite heavily with librarians in the systematic review process.
formulate the review question, but I'm going to combine these two together because formulating that question and defining these inclusion and exclusion criteria based on the concepts, asking that question in an answerable format, are so closely linked. And this one, I'm actually going to split into two. I'm not talking about locating studies because we transition from asking that question into developing a search strategy. And then once we have our strategy right, we go and apply and actually search. So, beginning at step one, as I said, I'm going to address the question and this PICO mnemonic altogether at this point, and then we'll talk about developing the search strategy and actually searching for the evidence. So the question, and the question is arguably probably the most important part of that entire process. The main reason being because it's the first step in the process. And if we don't step off on the right foot, then there could be trouble and problems all the way through the rest of those steps. So the aim of the question is really to provide a framework for the development and also the conduct of that review all the way through those steps in that process. And a good question supports the review, whilst a poor question risks confounding the review. And I'll give you some examples in a moment. So you will have heard of uh, systematic reviews or reviews of effects or effectiveness, which are what um, fuel the Cochrane Library and a lot of the, the Joanna Briggs, um, the JBI database of systematic reviews and implementation reports are these types of reviews. They focus on the effectiveness of an intervention or a therapy. Often that's used in medical practice, for example, but also in nursing practice and across allied health and through the health professions. Now this PICO mnemonic, which many of you as librarians will be clearly very familiar with, simply refers to the population, the intervention, the comparator, and the outcome. Sometimes you'll see that extended to PICOT, which may be also the types of studies, often the timing of an intervention, or sometimes PICOS, we refer to the study design. Um, but this same mnemonic, PICO, can also be used to guide moving from a question into eligibility criteria and being able to ask that question in an answerable format to reviews of qualitative and textual data. So we still refer to a PICO, but here we're referring to a population. And now, because we're talking about qualitative data, so this might be a question that's looking into the, the meaningfulness or how a patient experiences a particular intervention or therapy. And we talk here about a phenomena of interest rather than an intervention and a comparator. Or we also talk about the context. So we're not specifying any outcomes in particular. But I'll go into a bit more detail in just a moment. So here's an example question for a review that's looking into the effectiveness of an interventional therapy. And this is a really nice example of how we ask a question in an answerable format. This question here could be asked by a clinician standing in the ward, might be a doctor, might be a nurse, with a bottle of chlorhexidine in their hand saying, is it necessary? Do we need this stuff? Asking that same question in an answerable format would look something like this. Are antiseptic washes our intervention? More effective than non-antiseptic washes, our comparison might just be sterile water, at preventing nosocomial infections, our outcome, in patients undergoing surgery, our population. And instantly, we've conceptually divided that question ready to launch into our search strategy. So asking this same question, does this stuff work, is exactly the same as breaking it up like this and we're ready to go to start developing our search strategy based on these four concepts. The same, as I mentioned, can be done with other types of evidence. And here, if we have a question of experiential evidence, experiential evidence, I beg your pardon, where the Joanna Briggs Institute has been a recognised leader in developing these methodologies of synthesis of this type of evidence and their use in systematic reviews, we now talk about the phenomena of interest, which relates to the defined event, activity, experience or process, and we turn to the context rather than comparator. An example of asking a question in an answerable format, what are caregivers, and our population here, the caregivers who are providing 
home-based care to persons with HIV AIDS. Our phenomena of interest are the experiences of those caregivers providing home-based care to persons with HIV AIDS and our contact, context here being in Africa. Again, we've asked it in a way that can, with those concepts clearly visible, to be able to help us launch into our search. Now, there are again all sorts of different questions that can be put to systematic review and asked in healthcare. The criteria, while we ask the question in the same way, instantly we know that the types of studies that we should be looking for when we're searching will change based on the question. When I ask a question of the effectiveness of a therapy or an intervention, I'm looking for a causal association. Um, similarly, I actually want to know if I use a particular intervention with a patient, is it going to be harmful or not? But I can't really conduct an experiment to do that. So in these types of reviews, we will start to introduce often, you'll see observational research introduced to actually see what harms occur or adverse events occur in people who are given a particular intervention. Similarly with etiology of disease, we can't measure that experimentally. We just look at observational research. So instantly, depending on the question, some of those eligibility criteria may change. And it's also important to note that whilst a lot of this systematic reviewing kicked off in healthcare, and with that first statement by Archie Cochrane back in 1972, now it's being applied across an entire range of fields, in agriculture, in developmental studies, they're used in law, they're used in economics, systematic reviews, that all that follow the same um, objective criteria to address existing research evidence to inform policy and practice in all these various fields. So, we've asked a question and we use those concepts, those parts of that question now to develop those important eligibility criteria. So what are the important characteristics of the population? Are we interested in children or adults? Uh, if we're interested in diabetics, is there some aspect of the setting, for example, that's important? Is those um, diabetics who are receiving treatment in the community as opposed to the hospital setting? Um, we've spoken about our intervention, we're talking about a drug, is it an IV? Is it an oral administration of a particular drug? A comparator it can be active or passive. Are we comparing it to another drug that's been previously used or simply to a placebo? And of course, the all important outcomes of interest. So these are all derived and the study type, the appropriate study type, as I just mentioned, directly from that question that's being asked. So you can see how important it is. And, and it is so important for this reason, and this is where librarians will be, uh, also should take the opportunity to guide researchers because we have this wonderful knack of wanting to do everything. Funders like a lot of a big bang for their buck. They want all their questions answered. Researchers like to be able to answer everything, but the key to a systematic review, to, to a manageable systematic review that will actually provide useful results is often a focused question like those two that I just showed you, which gives a clear guide to the data that the reviewer will look for and will allow the, the researchers to arrive at clear conclusions. Versus a broad question where when these are asked, we open up the door to accumulating vast amounts of heterogeneous data that is actually very difficult to synthesise if we have all different types of study designs. Um, and, and the broader it gets, often the more difficult it is to conduct and the, often the utility of the exercise decreases uh, quite markedly. Some of the other problems that arise at this point, if we aren't making that transition from question to PICO, um, and if uh, these inclusion criteria are poorly defined and the researchers or reviewers fail to follow that process, you, we often see that there's a lack of congruency but sometimes between the review objectives and the questions that are being asked and the results that are being presented. And it really does impact on the output of what really comes out from this research process. I'll give you a brief example. Here's the aim, essentially the question. We can delve into the question here of a systematic review. 
The aim of this systematic review is to investigate whether poor sleep quantity and or quality in children and adolescents aged 3 to 18 years is associated with poor dietary intake and behaviours and suboptimal physical activity and sedentary behaviour patterns. So they're basically taking a step back. There's good research evidence and there are systematic reviews, well conducted systematic reviews that show if you have poor sleep quality, the likelihood is you'll be overweight. Okay? You'll have a high BMI. And they're taking a step back to see does this explain it? The fact that potentially these children have poor dietary behaviour, are they binge eating for example, or are they not exercising as a result of the fact they're not sleeping well? So a question for systematic review. And here's what the, the PICO, the eligibility criteria look like. A clear description of the participants, healthy children aged 3 to 18 years, excluded with comorbidities. Now we get to the intervention. Now in this case, it's not really an intervention, it's more an exposure. And remember, we're looking for that association between poor sleep and um, these, these outcomes uh, of sedentary behaviour, physical activity and dietary behaviour. And here, um, so the sleep architecture and dietary patterns we actually missed the physical activity in this case, but most importantly, here's where alarm bells start ringing in terms of not following that PICO mnemonic and the concepts that it helps researchers deal with. The primary outcome measures were sleep quantity, quality, dietary intake, physical activity, this isn't actually the outcome of interest in this association. Here there's been a mix up of the dependent and the independent variables. This is the exposure. And what I'd expect to see with this question is sleep quantity measured here as the exposure. It might be in a particular number of hours per night, or it might be in quantiles of sleep. So little, a moderate amount, and lots of sleep, which might be greater than eight hours. Moderate amount might be five to eight hours and less than five hours might be a little sleep. And that I'd expect to see an association then with dietary behaviours and physical behaviours. And because of that mix up how the results presented to us in the review. Of the seven studies included five reported activity and sleep related outcomes and five dietary and sleep related outcomes. But me as a reader, I have no idea which way this association has gone. Did the poor sleep lead to Physical, acti physical activity one way or the other? Or was it the lack of physical activity that led to poor sleep? Or too much physical activity that led to poor sleep? Similarly, was it dietary behaviours that arose from poor sleep or vice versa? You actually don't know. And you don't know in reading the report either. The majority of studies were excluded for not measuring the outcome of interest. Or was that the sleep? or was it the dietary behaviour or the physical activity? You don't know, and that all arises simply from this mix-up in concept right here in moving from that question through to these eligibility criteria. Now, that's all well and good, but I'm sure many of you are thinking, where does the librarian fit into all of that? Well, I'm saying the librarian is so important in these first three steps, because I train a lot of systematic reviewers um, and when they get to this point this is when I send them to their librarian. So they'll often come and I'm sure many librarians will see researchers come in and this much they've attempted themselves. So sometimes you're taking a step back when you're dealing with the researchers because it's not often that we involve our librarians right at the start in this review process unfortunately in many cases because it would be a lot easier sometimes to be able to do that but you'll often catch them here when they've already attempted all of that. So as I said what what do the researchers what do the reviewers know? Well we lead them through the, qu the question through the PICO we help them define eligibility criteria when we're teaching them when we're training people how to do systematic reviews and we show them an example search strategy we tell them all the places they can go and search and then they move into it. And the first thing we tell them when it comes to searching is that they should be looking to see if there are any other systematic reviews conducted on this topic. And if there are, 
then they sh good systematic reviews that is, then they shouldn't be doing it. Unlike primary research, there's no added value of redoing a systematic review more than once, a good systematic review. Sometimes, yes, they do need updating, and they need updating often as more research is added to any particular field. At this point, it's worth taking a step back um, and just to bring the systematic reviewer and the search that they undertake um, back into that field of evidence-based healthcare and evidence-based practice in general. An evidence-based practitioner, that is a clinician, for example, using evidence to inform their practice, would use a similar approach of asking a question in an answerable format. But the way they'll approach their searching is quite different from the systematic reviewer, or the places, sorry, that they'll look to conduct their search. Here's the 5S pyramid, which started as a 4S and now has graduated to a 6S pyramid, of how some of this information is organised. Um, now, the evidence-based practitioner, when they have a question, will start as close to the top as possible. For example, there are very few clinical computerised decision support systems available, but summaries, for instance, are some of what you'll find in the JBI Connect Plus database, which is a point of care uh, online system of evidence. Um, the systematic reviewer, on the other hand, beyond that first look to see if any similar systematic reviews have been conducted that I just mentioned, they might look here towards the syntheses, will be conducting all of their search at this level of studies, at this primary research literature, which they'll then accumulate in relation to their question and look to synthesise the best available evidence from amongst there. It will be at this point that the researcher may appear at your door um, for help in conducting the search. Um, and depending on that knock of the door, you might find that there's quite a different person standing there. It may be the academic researcher, it may be a methodologist with some experience in conducting systematic reviews, it may be a clinician who's, had, uh, who's con doing something in practice and has a real interest to see if it's the right thing to do or the right way to do a particular thing in practice. Or it may very well be a student who's undertaking this as a part of a research project. Um, and they will have different levels of experience in conducting systematic reviews. Um, in some cases, they may not entirely understand what a systematic review is, or if it is the most appropriate type of research for the particular question that they have. Because a systematic, there are some questions which aren't appropriate for a systematic review. But who this particular person is that's knocking on your door, and where they're coming from, will impact and dictate to some extent the sort of interaction that you as the librarian have with them. Um, but it's so important that it's clear that the researcher, that the team involved, the librarian yourself, know and understand the question. What is the relevant PICO? Um, what type of evidence, what type of question is being asked that lends itself to a particular type of evidence? Is it more appropriate that this be broken down into multiple questions? And there are many reviews which might address multiple questions. Are there extra concepts or less concepts that need to be considered than what is presented purely by just looking at the PICO itself? An example there may be of extra concepts may be, I mentioned before, if our population were um, diabetics being um, being treated in community clinics as opposed to the hospital. Well, if we were looking at that conceptually, what we'll find is that that one defining feature of the population now would be broken into two concepts. And when I conduct my search, I won't see the diabetics and the, uh, the community setting in one concept, conceptual uh, column in this case, but rather I'd see that broken into two. So we've added an extra concept there. But here, this is an example of how we essentially teach our reviewers to search. Um, in this case, we're interested in nursing management of cancer fatigue in patients. So there are three concepts here, the cancer, the fatigue, the nursing. And we tell our, this is using the Boolean operator or, um, the different keywords or mesh headings that they know of that could describe this concept here for fatigue, and we combine all of those with the Boolean operator OR. So we're getting as much as possible here. Then, to really address this question, we want to tie it all together. So after they've arranged this sort of concept map that we call it, we tied the cancer and fatigue and nursing conceptually. And our search will spit out the results that contain any one of these terms with any one of the others.
and that will essentially form the results of our search and our search strategy. But this is what researchers really struggle with and why it's so important that librarians are involved and how that they, they can actually really make sure that the most comes out of the search strategy is that the, the tools that we use to search databases don't necessarily conceptualise things the way we do. And sometimes we struggle with that. We might, at often the same words that are used have different definitions and meanings. They're not necessarily all related to that con our concept of interest. And sometimes the opposite is true. Different words have the same definitions and meanings. But we have to be clear that we know how the databases are organised conceptually. And that takes, in itself, quite a bit of research. Sometimes the researchers and the reviewers don't actually appreciate is necessary to do what the scope of a particular mesh heading is that has a one-word title. And that's really where librarians can help really make sure that the search is hitting, that that is aligned with what the question is asking and the PICO concepts that have come out of it. The other problem often that you will come to appreciate is that sometimes not everyone comes armed with their own question. It might be the funders that have given them a particular question. And some of these questions, if they're broad, and they often are, sometimes the research is only the middleman, and conceptually they're not clear on what the question is all about. And you'll see that, and in preparing for this, I did actually take the time to go and essentially interview our research librarian at the University of Adelaide, where I work. And I could see the frustration appear in her eyes, really pointing out that so many reviewers or people who go looking to the literature to find research evidence, they have this major difficulty being able to conceptualise their question. They can't describe what they're trying to do. When they're put to the question, we're scratching our heads and we really cannot describe it. And often the librarian finds themselves in a position where they're trying to actually interpret what the aims of the project are, just in delving into trying to get the search strategy right. These are some of the other lines that I've heard quite often from librarians. This is describing the people that come to them looking for help to search. That we have no capacity to be logical. The logic grid doesn't reflect what she's trying to do. It's not rocket science. But that the essential elements are language and logic. And sometimes we don't actually speak the right language. We don't actually know the language that some of these databases are speaking, and we don't know how to organise those concepts to be able to maximise the return from these databases. So the other thing, researchers, people like me, often fail to appreciate that the search is such an incredibly important part of the review process. I mentioned right at the beginning of the talk about what's, what a systematic review is. Both of those statements started out with, it's an attempt. There's no guaranteed result. You're attempting to do all of this, identify, appraise and synthesise the research evidence. Sometimes we might end up with an empty review. There's actually no studies, good studies in relation to this question. What we don't want to do is A, not search or not find evidence that actually exists when it's out there, because then we'll look pretty silly. But in essence, the key feature to be aware of as a reviewer and someone working on a review project is that if we don't find any research evidence, in essence, we, don't, we haven't done a systematic, we, we haven't got the systematic review. So how to search and where to search are some of the defining features of the review process. And there are many, many systematic reviews out there, which, for example, say we searched Medline. That, to me, doesn't sit as a systematic review. A systematic review search should be much more comprehensive than that, but I'll speak to you a bit more about that in just a moment. But one thing researchers will understand in constructing this whole search strategy is this idea of reproducibility. And one of the core features of a systematic review is that if any other person or any other reviewer took that question and applied the same uh, steps, the same methodology of review, and importantly, the same search strategy, they should end up with roughly the same conclusions that you do by the end of it. And to be able to do that, they must see your search strategy and it must be documented clearly. 
in how that, and you should see that in a systematic review and be able to see how a, a question has evolved into a search strategy. It's all required that it's reported. So again, it's just, we spoke about the difficulties moving from a question to the, and asking it in an answerable format, creating that PICO uh, to inform your inclusion criteria and eligibility criteria, and sometimes even in the search strategy, that falls apart. It's confusing when some questions don't have all the elements of a PICO. Okay, sometimes the comparator, for instance, is often not stipulated in a question. It's slightly broader. They're just looking to the effectiveness of an intervention and, and trying to identify what comparisons are being made in the literature. There may be different elements, which I mentioned already in an example of different settings. But for the most part, for someone with experience in systematic reviews, the search strategy and developing the search strategy is, I believe, infinitely more important than the search itself. And we certainly invest a great deal more time getting the strategy right. Once we've got that right, going to the databases and doing the search actually isn't that time consuming. And that's sometimes difficult to swallow for the researcher who's looking for the results. And we're really interested in the, you know, the glory of the systematic review, which is the synthesizing and coming out with the results. Everything else can be a bit of a nuisance. But if we don't find the research, we can't do that. That's why this is so important, even though it's probably the, you know, the searching, I describe it as the least romantic part of the systematic review process, but it is probably one of the most important parts of the review process. It's very easy to turn around and redo a meta-analysis and redo the statistics. It's not easy to go back and redo the search because you're basically starting again from scratch. Okay, now moving on to actually applying that search strategy and step three, searching for the evidence. Now, even searching in a systematic review can look a bit different depending on the methodologies that are used and the questions asked. Looking at qualitative reviews, for example, you might see differences whether the search is considered to be exhaustive, which is what we'd normally do for a review of effectiveness, or is it saturation based? And some methodologies will only search until up to the point where they seem to be finding nothing new and then they'll stop, which isn't what we'd see in a JBI review of effectiveness or a JBI qualitative review for that matter. This is a much, more, uh, is a much bigger issue and it applies to any type of systematic review and that is really the extent of the search. Is it a comprehensive search? And this is really the only surefire way in how far and wide we search in that attempt to identify all of the available literature is our only real way to minimise, for example, publication bias. And that is you know, the possibility that, that uh, some results aren't published in the mainstream journals because they're negative results, for example. Sometimes they're not published at all. I mean, we could do a lot of statistical tricks to minimise publication bias, but this is the best way to be sure of it, to be sure that we've searched as far as wide and possible, as possible. The search that we conduct will impact on the transparency and its reporting, as I mentioned, and the reproducibility of any review project. But this is really the big issue, and it's the big issue that researchers will look to librarians to guide them, and that is where is it appropriate to search? How much is enough? How far and wide should I be looking? And just to prime you, the librarian, for what you will encounter from researchers is that when we're talking about searching um, to inform systematic reviews and to undertake a systematic review project, well, we tell researchers that they should be using all sorts of sources of information. Yes, the scientific databases that have many of these scientific journals indexed therein, but then, depending on the question, various organisations, the websites of those organisations, actual libraries, it might be even tapping into experts. Many systematic reviews will do that. And what will they find amongst these resources? Of course, the most common are the peer-reviewed journal articles. It might be the research or the, the opinion that's published there. Grey literature is an important one. The unpublished studies that systematic reviews should look for, as well as theses, dissertations, 
So much research is locked in theses and dissertations. So much of the research is conducted by higher degree and PhD research students around the world. Dependent on the question that's asked, it might be census data that's important. That's locked away in you know, country statistics, for example. But it all needs to be found to be able to inform a particular question. Some questions will lend themselves to this type of evidence, to looking in these sorts of places. Other questions won't. And we tell reviewers, everyone's heard of PubMed. Everyone has, who's in, in health research. A lot of people haven't heard of anything else. And when you open up this world of all of these different databases that are out there, many people are amazed. Many people are overwhelmed by the amount that's out there. There's just a snapshot, I'm sure you're aware of many more. Um, but it's certainly again at this point that we, or me, who often train systematic reviewers, I'll point the finger in your direction and say, now's about the time you better speak to your librarian. Similarly, when we talk about grey literature, often confuses a lot of systematic reviewers. What is it? What's it all about? Where do you find it? These are some of the tools we use to find grey literature, but again, we send them to consult with their librarian. And what will you see as a result of that process that we go through? Well, I see many systematic review protocols that after they've been informed about all the wonders of the information that's out there and all these places you can look and these major databases where you should search, I see protocols that tell me that they're planning to search PubMed, Medline, Web and Knowledge Scopus, for example. They've listed them all. And in essence, they're searching Medline four times. Is that really what they want to do? Maximise the, the amount of duplication? I think not. But many researchers will not know it because they've never invested the time to actually explore and find out what exactly is within these databases. This one I see often, a review of effectiveness that will search the Cochrane Library. Well, the Cochrane Library has a five or six different databases within it. There's the database of systematic reviews, the database of abstracts of reviews and effects, the uh, health technology assessment database, the NHS economic evaluation database, um, and the methodological development database, the methodological reviews database. But the really important one for review of effectiveness is Cochrane Central's trial register. That's really the only one of use to a systematic reviewer once they've established that their review hasn't already been conducted by the Cochrane Collaboration. Um, and also qualitative reviews. Well, the Cochrane Collaboration don't conduct qualitative reviews as of yet. So why would you search there? And these are the sorts of things where a librarian who's looking for these sorts of issues, who comes across them, can actually save a review team a whole lot of time and unnecessary pain, for want of a better word. You know, often we set limits to our search to limit the size of a, of a particular project. But why? That needs to be justified. It might be, you know, the time a particular intervention has been used or was introduced. But it is also super important that the international research is being identified. Despite the fact my question might be relevant to what I do in practice here, I should be looking to the international research evidence to inform that question. And I won't get there unless I'm looking in the right places. This always confounds particularly novice reviewers. By the end of their first systematic review, they have a much better grounding in the difference between the database that they're searching and the search platform that they use to search the database. I've heard so many times I'm going to do a search of Ovid. Or I'm, going, so I'm going to search PubMed and Ovid Medline. Again, they look at these as two separate databases. This is another big problem and it's where we really rely on our research librarians in being able to make the most of these various platforms in the mastery of the different wildcard characters that they use and, and all the different tricks that are in there to be able to make the search strategy uh, be as sensitive and specific as possible in relation to a systematic review process and, tr and trying to find the evidence that's available. But similarly, that works both ways. And whilst those many people conducting systematic reviews, I think you'll appreciate when you're working with them closely, knowing what you know as librarians, you will scratch your head and think these people should know a bit more about this if they're going to do this effectively. Likewise, I believe you can't really do the experiment 
unless you understand the tools you're working with. And that applies, to, as I said, to us, the researchers. But as I mentioned right at the start of this presentation, I think it is well worthwhile that librarians do inform themselves or have some idea of where this is all going in terms of the systematic review process itself and what actually occurs in those next steps of selecting studies, appraising the research, what's the key to appraising research, how data extraction or abstraction is conducted, and what are some of the, the overriding principles and methodologies of data synthesis. And we refer, and I must admit, being a reviewer who now has come to understand some of the intricacies of searching, I feel much better placed to be able to do this sort of work myself. And I think you'll find, in speaking to many librarians, that similarly, a librarian who has some knowledge of the topic that's being investigated can add an incredible amount of value to the research process, especially in terms of, again, dealing with those concepts about a particular topic when moving from the question through to the search strategy. And it may be worthwhile that when you sit with those researchers, you know, that review team, that the first thing you ask them to do is give me the nature of the problem. You know, what are we talking about here? What are the characteristics of these people? What is the problem we hear? Even before you really focus in on that first question. And it may be the time that you need to do a little bit of research yourself to inform yourself about the topic of interest and beyond the methods that we're talking about here in the methodologies. So, in summary, in this presentation, I spoke to you a little bit right at the start about systematic reviews and where they sit in that, that model of evidence-based healthcare. And I refer to them as the pillars of evidence-based healthcare because of that incredibly important place that they sit in bridging that gap between the world of research evidence and the clinical world where that evidence is put into practice. They really are the pillars that, that bridge the gap or that hold up the bridge between the research and the clinical practice. And then we moved into, after defining a bit about what systematic reviews are, how, what the librarians will be dealing with and what the role is, your role will be, could be in a systematic review team. And so much of it lands on getting that question right and helping researchers conceptualise that question so it can lead into an appropriate and effective search strategy for a review because it has such an enormous impact on on what comes next, being able to locate the evidence. And I hope you have an appreciation just how critical what you do is to the success of the review project. Because so many researchers, who, particularly those starting out who undertake this process, really don't understand the sort of tools that you use and the way to best use them and to appreciate the sort of impact that it will have. So thank you all for your attention and I hope you've enjoyed the presentation.